Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's version of the Digital Services Forum. I want to, um, we're going to have a special guest speaker today, and we're going to talk about business architecture, and we're going to overview this, this discipline, but also I'm going to tie it back into CSDM a little bit, which has been a big focus of our conversations, which is the model that ServiceNow uses in their, in their CMDB, and I know that's why a lot of us are here today. So before I start, I want to just go in and we always talk about the group. So first of all, if anybody's here for the first time, and I know a lot of you are today, but if you could just drop your name and where you're from and what you do in the chat, that'd be great. We'd like to have all of our members welcomed and we'll even go back there and, and make sure that we welcome you on our community. And we do have a couple assets that will be useful to you if you're just joining. So on the bottom, there's this link, and I'm going to post this link after I stop talking and hand it over to our guest speaker for today. I'll post it in the channel, and it gives you a connection to our Zoom registration, so that it's the same every week, so you can come in here and register for future meetings. It also gives you access to the forum. The forum is where we share all the information, and our presenter today, uh, he already shared his presentation, so that will be up on that forum page uh, shortly after this meeting's over. We record all of our meetings, so they'll be on the YouTube playlist. And if you want to get a link, we have a shared instance. It's a little sluggish, but it has a lot of the demos that we do from this meeting inside of there. So I'll get all of that information out to you on the chat. It's all in this one link. So that'll take you to our community post that gives you all of these links. It's a good one to save if you want to go back and get any information from the group. So our vision changed about a year and a half ago, and it's really to help you with your digital transformation. And that's a lot of times why people bring in the ServiceNow platform. And last week we had a presenter on a CIO that actually used it for two digital transformations. So our mission is to enable members for whatever part they're performing as part of their own digital transformation, to enable them to do that better and using ServiceNow platform along the way. We share as much work as we can. It might be code, it might be papers. A lot of times it's these videos that we're recording right now will be useful to you, replaying a little chunk of them. And the team is the team that I'm on is the enterprise architecture team at ServiceNow. We're the ones that host these meetings. So we'll arrange all of the speakers and all of the content. So if you do have something you wanna share with the group and it's not polished presentations, it could be stuff that's broken that you bring sometimes. Anything you think will be worth sharing, uh, for people that are doing those above three things, then definitely bring it to my attention or to one of our other co-hosts' attention. Our main way to get information out is this meeting you're on today. We have these bi-weekly calls, and then we bring up content that we hear a lot of things going on in the field. Business architecture, which we're gonna talk about today, is definitely one of those things. So I'm gonna do a little bit of tying it back to the CSDM to make sure that we, um, you know why did I ask Bill to come speak today? And then I'm going to hand it over to Bill, and he's going to take us through business architecture. And it's um, it's really good to understand that piece because it definitely touches on the model that we work on a lot inside of the CMDB. So this is our model that we talk about all the time, and I always explain it like this. The most important part is on the screen right now, the most important part of the model, and that's the people on the outside. And so before we add all these blocks and lines, we talk about the people. There's always a, a need in, a, in an organization to bring in a new capability or refine existing capability. And there's a design people that take care of that. That's where the, a lot of the enterprise architects sit. When they bring that stuff in, it never works. You got to give it to a team that's going to configure it or maybe even code some things before it's useful to your organization. But that team can't do anything until operations turn some lights on, right? It makes it work inside their environment. Give me a prod environment, give me a test environment, give me a data environment. And then finally, that capability that you needed is delivered back to the business consumer. Okay, and that's the model that we follow. And then when you go and look at that common service data model inside the CMDB, this is the, you know, when we start adding the boxes and lines, right? The less important part, but still important, Right, is we have definitely places to rest all of this data that sits inside each of those different domains uh, for our model. Now, the one we're going to talk about today uh, up in the enterprise architecture domain, and you'll see a little bit of data down here in our new uh, value stream models. And right, so when we 
the model that Bill's going to touch on, and I'm just going to give a quick peek here with the, the BizBoc, it's called. And the BizBoc ties back into our model, and you'll see some of the places where there's overlap. So we have a business capability table. We have some enterprise architects that use ServiceNow either for all or part of their, their repository, and then also value streams and business processes. And the model, you'll see that it comes in, it's going to it's going to be able to help in several different areas. So if you are using the guilds model, uh, it'll work really nicely to get you started in those domains, or hopefully you, your architect's already using it and they could plug it in and get you started in those areas for the CSDM. Because a lot of times people think, hey, if I'm going to do a CMDB project, I have to get somebody, I have to get my CMDB person to enter all this data themselves. And that's definitely not the case. Like if you don't, if you need this, this data should come from the people that, that need it. It shouldn't be one CMDB person sitting there trying to maintain this entire model because that, that would just be daunting. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bill. And Bill, I think you just take share over. Okay. Let me, and tell uh, us what business architecture is. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, everybody can see the screen. Yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. All right. So uh, thanks for joining today. And um, uh, as I, my name says William Ulrich. I am, that is my name. I go by Bill in uh, conversation. And uh, I have three different hats. I'm wearing the Business Architecture Guild hat today. Uh, I am a co-founder on the board of directors at the Guild. Uh, they were founded in 2010. A little more information at the back end. I've got a slide on the Guild and what they offer. And if you want to get more information on business architecture. Uh, I also have a consultancy that I founded in 1990, which seems like a really long time ago now, uh, after I left KPMG, which is where I spent uh, the bulk of the 80s. And uh, I also have a training company, which is um, separate and apart that I have a, um, a training partner I work with. Uh, we work together, uh, the two of us underneath uh, the company, Business Architecture Associates, that's our company. Uh, so I'm a co-founder of that, and uh, that company does independent training. The Guild doesn't do consulting. It doesn't do training. It's, it's an association. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll explain a little more, more about that at the wrap-up today. Uh, the, uh, if you're interested in anything, anything else other than uh, just sort of background or, or you know, information on business architecture and the BizBot Guide and those types of things, um, you, know, you can let me know, and I can be happy to talk about that. So uh, the, the title today is a brief overview of an essential discipline. And um, it, it is brief, it's 19 slides, and it doesn't go into a deep dive on any particular topic. However, I am willing to answer questions where there are uh, maybe blanks in, in, in terms of uh, an understanding just because I'm not providing a lot of detail. Uh, th there is an awful lot of detail out there. What we're going to cover today is uh, defining business architecture, just a quick quick view of that. Then we'll look at the role of business architecture. Why would we want a, to have business architecture in our organization? What, what does it even provide me in terms of benefit? Uh, where does it fit in terms of the overall big picture? Uh, it, and it's it particularly important in its role in strategy execution, end-to-end -end strategy execution, which we will lay out for you. Uh, there is a business architecture framework, which shows how the pieces fit together. Uh, also talking about uh, how business architecture fits in enterprise architecture. John did a nice intro there uh, in terms of the sponsorship for this uh, for these events that he runs. And uh, it, it does plug in very well. And uh, differentiators and common uses of business architecture uh, cross industry uh, usage and deployment. Um, lots and lots of industries globally are using business architecture. Uh, I get a little bit of a chance to see, um, or actually, I, I just query into uh, the, the business architecture guild member base periodically, and, and uh, they're in over 100 countries around the world. And once in a while, people post in the community and say, you know, um, uh, I just joined the guild. I'm happy to be here. I live in Tanzania and um, we don't have a lot of business architects here, but I'm hoping to be in part of a community. Um, so we'll talk about deployment, governance uh, practices. So where do I, you know, if I have business architecture, where does it fit? Who's using it? Uh, some industry usage citations and then uh, some resources you can look at 
post this conversation in addition to this uh, presentation and then advancing skills and, and, and practice for both organizations. If I'm an organization, I'm interested, how do I move forward? If I'm an individual and I wanna build knowledge and skills around business architecture, how do I move forward? So uh, let's go through a couple of definitions here. De definitions are, are nice to have as a reference point. Uh, they are not the end all and be all. Uh, there's two definitions. There's a historic definition, which is um, sort of a uh, sort of a nice way to talk about business architecture as being a blueprint of the enterprise. That's your organization, providing a common understanding. And so, if I look at this, uh, I can look at it from many angles. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm in planning, or I'm, an, I'm a designer, or I'm in an implementation team, or I'm an architect. I I still can use this. Uh, to align my strategic objectives and deliver on those and deliver on tactical demands. The more formal definition comes from uh, an organization called the Federation of Enterprise uh, Architecture Professionals, FIPO. Uh, it's not overly active right now, but it's an association of associations. And they defined it, and, and we're going to go through these, so I'm not going to read it to you, as basically the domains of business architecture. You see capabilities, value, information, and so on. We'll talk about that as we get into this today later. Uh, value proposition. Uh, this is the elevator pitch, uh, as we say. And um, it's like, how do I tell somebody what business <clears throat> architecture is if I only have 30 seconds and I'm, I'm on an elevator with uh, a senior person and they said, what are you up to these days, so-and-so? They say, well, I'm working on business architecture. Oh, what's that? Well, it enables strategy, streamlined strategy execution. So when you want to ex execute and deliver on your strategy, business architecture is something to get you there, starting from the beginning and going through the end. Right, so the quick quick answer, um, you know, you can always delve into more topics, but uh, I like to have an elevator pitch ready when people ask. So what is this strategy execution? What is this end-to-end -end strategy execution and why is it relevant? Let's, let's, let's answer that question first. Uh, the why is it relevant is um, as organizations, there's a few things we don't do real well. Uh, and there's some statistics on this. Uh, the first one I like to cite is uh, related to um, programs and project delivery. And it is from 30, well, 25 years of software projects and research. Over a 25 year period, the Standish Group has been putting out uh, something called the Chaos Report. And over 25 years, they looked at the trends of how well organizations are doing with delivering successfully on their programs and projects. Uh, and, and in the unsuccessful category are failures and then challenge projects, which are overruns uh, uh, in both time and cost, as well as under delivering in terms of what, what was promised. Uh, under 30% of programs and projects industry-wide are delivered successfully. That number has barely moved in a 25 year period. So if you think about, and that ran up pretty much through 20, I think 2023 if, uh, or 2021 maybe. If you think, kind of think about all the things we've invested in, all the new technology, all the new methods, we've got agile and scaled agile with safe and, and DevOps and all the other great things out there we have not made a big dent into delivering projects and programs more successfully. Uh, that's a concern. And um, the, the reason is that uh, if you look at this five-stage framework, most of our investments are at the deployment stage where we're building things, right? As opposed to the lead-in stages, we'll go through this in more detail. 80% of leaders believe their company is good at crafting strategy, but only 44% in its implementation. That's supported by some other statistics. You can look at that implementation survey. And nine out of 10 business leaders can see they are missing major opportunities in the market. So none of those are good. Uh, most of those overlap with most organizations. So what we're looking for is successful strategy execution, end-to-end. -end. Uh, if, if, we, if we craft and frame an investment around an initiative or multiple initiatives, we want to deliver on that when we said we want to deliver, right? And so it relies on a shared perspective of uh, the organization from strategy formulation through deployment. So leveraging business architecture across strategy execution allows you to do an end-to-end -end traceability so that I can say, this is what I said I wanted to do in my annual planning. At the end of the year, I delivered it, right? And full, full visibility into every stakeholder engaged in planning, solution design, program management, and implementation. Now, we'll, we'll break this down some more uh, as we go. 
So let's take a look at the individual stages here and what's exactly happening, right? Uh, this is where we want to really maximize business architecture's role from planning through solution deployment. So we'll start out with saying that, you know, in the planning stage, when I'm setting my, my goals, my objectives, my courses of action, my KPIs, right? We're going to have strategists, planners uh, also indicated there, we should have business architects. Why? Because they bring a level of visibility to the enterprise that's not there as a rule in most cases, right? So we can say, well, if you're doing this, there are three other areas that want to do the same thing. Why not collaborate? Because if you don't collaborate, the customer is going to be unhappy, right? So defining strategy with full confidence. What's the impact analysis? This is amazingly an area that a lot of people just skip over. These are the things I want to do. Most organizations or many times go to, here's some money, start a project, and start building or start deploying, right? And, and they jump right to almost through stage four, right into stage five. No impact analysis. Impact analysis is left up to the architects, the solution architects, the delivery teams, and everybody else that's trying to figure out how to make this stuff work and realizing that the scope's too small, the scope's too big. There's six other projects doing the exact same thing I'm trying to do. If I deliver this and they deliver that, it's not going to work together. Interoperability is going is gonna, is gonna to suffer. Impact analysis catches that up front, both from a business and a technical standpoint. Uh, design, what does the future look like? A lot of times we can't, we don't know that, right? We sort of wander around and think, okay, we're going to do this and do that, and then eventually we'll, we'll be successful, right? Um, and some people think that that's okay. That's not okay, right? If the data architecture needs to change, or the solution architecture needs to change, or a new business design or solution design needs to be implemented, we need to know that. And we need to know that up front because that's going to impact how we frame our initiatives, which are programs and projects, and how we invest in those. And then going into solution delivery, <clears throat> continuing to use the same business architecture that we used up, up at the front end, right? Now, I just want to highlight that not all roles and, uh, are shown, right? There's subject matter experts, there's leadership, there's other people along the way. Uh, I sort of highlighted the, a lot of the architects and, and the <clears throat> roles they play here as, as we go through here. Now, let me give you another view here. So you saw this picture, courtesy of John on the intro. Uh, this is from what's called the BizBot Guide. Uh, the BizBot Guide is uh, short for a guide to the business architecture body of knowledge, right? It's been around for uh, more than 10 years. It's on uh, version 12. Uh, it is available for, as, a, as a member of the Business Architecture Guild. You can get the BizBot Guide and, and a whole bunch of other things the Guild offers. But this is for the basic foundation for business architecture. There's 10 domains here. And while I'm not going to break them all down today, you'll see in the core, which makes up the baseline of the business architecture, the, the <clears> foundation, <throat> our capabilities, value streams, information, and organization. They're all important. Uh, the capabilities sort of are the glue to hold things together. But if you have capabilities and no value streams, you do not have a business architecture. You have a capabilities, and that is not enough because value streams are what bring capabilities uh, to life in terms of del value delivery. Information and organization also critically important. Now around the outside, you'll see we can connect our strategies, our initiatives, products we deliver, policies we enforce, stakeholders that engage, and metrics that we measure, right? So that's the business architecture in a nutshell. Now, if, if I bring this back here, I'm going to say that this is the view, at least some subset and some cross-section, and it's always a subset solves a cross-section of these views, uh, deliver value or provide value as I move through the five stages of strategy execution. Uh, I may be over, very interested <coughs> in information <coughs> and, and very interested in some other aspects as I go through and do a redesign of my data architecture for whatever reason, right? Um, I may be particularly interested in my organization map if I'm doing a merger and acquisition. So there's a whole lot of different uses and views on this whole thing. Um, we, we have what we call a minimally viable baseline of business architecture. This is what you need in order to practice the discipline. So we need most organizations or a lot of organizations with business architecture are still struggling with the build out, right? You need to move on from the build out to the execution and delivery of value. That's the most critical thing with business architecture. The minimally viable business architecture you need 
to launch and, and to leverage it, basically, to leverage it on end-to-end -end strategy execution is a capability map, a corresponding information map, and value streams. The ideal is to have the organization map, but that can come along, right? So that's the baseline. Uh, this is the whole picture, and this is how we employ it, again, at a very high level, of course, end-to-end uh, -end on a strategy execution. Uh, from a framework perspective, what's the foundation? How do we how do we implement something like this, right? Well, you need a knowledge base, right? Uh, the knowledge base can be whatever you want it to be. Um, it's it's usually a um, meta model based repository of some sort that connects all these pieces and more. That you're just seeing the very tip of the iceberg here, but connects all these pieces together in a way that you can access them easily when you need to access them, right? So. If we look at the business scenarios, these are the things I want to do with business architecture. A particular set of business scenarios, let's say I want to solve a, uh, a customer-related issue uh, that they have when they are um, using their a particular debit card or credit card, right? And we find a value stream for that. There should be one in the business architecture, and, and there always is if you have a formal business architecture in place. And we want to drill down to the weaknesses by looking at the cross-section of capabilities. That's just a small cross-section of, of the business architecture. If we can find which capabilities are an issue, we can trace those over to the information that it uses in the business architecture. And then we can trace those out to the systems and technologies that we use to implement, right? So that is an example of how we would use the knowledge base for a particular scenario with a subset of blueprints, right? Again, the knowledge base is that foundation, right? You build out the business architecture, you have a minimally viable baseline, it evolves over time, right? Uh, the key thing, and, and by the way, there's there's lots of technology to support that. So, um, you know, whether you're using ServiceNow or, or however, right? So, so that's a really, really critical perspective here, okay? And so um, as you go about using your technology, um, you, you want to make sure that, that the pieces can fit in there or over a period of time. Um, business architecture and enterprise architecture. Always get the question, so I'd like to head it off headed off of the past, so to speak, right? So um, how do they fit together? This is the discipline of business of business architecture and the discipline of enterprise architecture. It's not the, um, it, it's not the organizational structure. How you organize within your, within your enterprise is up to you, right? Um, but I will tell you that the more successful business architecture deployments uh, that have been out there, usually have the business architecture team in the business separate and apart from the enterprise architecture. But the, the flip side to that is you have to have a very, very close working relationship with all the architects in an enterprise architecture team um, and, and also federated out to the organization. So it's pretty critical. So we, we already talked about the business architecture and where it fits. What I wanna mention now are what we call the three pillars of the IT architecture. Uh, we have the application architecture, that, which obviously people are familiar with that. Software services are in there, our automations, our applications. The data architecture, right? And then the technical architecture, which is the underlying platforms and enabling technologies, right? Cross-section to that is a solution architecture, which is an initiative or portfolio, right? Integrated architecture perspective. Now, some people would say, this is the enterprise architecture, and um, it's these four pieces and they do tie together and there's ways to connect all of them together and that type of thing in, in, in an expanded knowledge base, right? That's important, right? And again, uh, John showed some of that at the beginning today on how you can put those pieces together. But um, some people would say, well, the solution architecture is outside of that. That's fair. Um, or you might say, well, it's just part of the bigger architecture picture. So it should really be in there as, as, as a discipline, right? Um, the idea here is that um, perspective-wise, this is enterprise architecture. Now, I've, I've met very few people in my career that are experts in all five of those cross-sections of views, right? I know I have met excellent solution architects. I have met stellar technical architects. I have met and worked with uh, amazing data architects and, and, and business architects and application architects, right? Um, it, it, the, it, the rare person 
who can say that they are expert across all five areas. What, what that means is in a typical organization, you need to have specialists in each of these areas and they all need to work together closely, right? Um, the relationships between, for example, the business architects and the business architecture and the data architects and the data architecture needs to be one that's very closely aligned, right? The same is true with uh, the application architects uh, and solution architects. So you have to build those relationships and make sure those are all working together. And you have to have a shared perspective. If the enterprise architects have their own knowledge base, and the data architects or the business architects have their own knowledge base, right? Um, that, then, you know, you may be able to sync those up. But the best case scenario is you have one knowledge base. It's a full representation of the business architecture plus all the other elements, right? So that's a really critical way of sort of thinking about things. Okay. So why is business architecture different? So wh why would I even introduce that, that conversation? Well, uh, let me go through uh, just a few on the list here. First of all, it's holistic. It's not constrained by business unit silos. A lot of times when I, I work with planning teams and we go into sort of an impact analysis and that type of thing, all of a sudden everybody's mind goes to business unit, business unit, business unit, silo, 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 right? Oh, that goes here. That goes here, right? Well, what if the solution spans those business units, right? How do they work together? Oh, boy, I don't know. We've never done that before, right? Business architecture, with the exception of the organization map, right? Um, it looks at the ecosystem as a whole, which means it doesn't stop at the legal boundaries. If you outsource to a partner certain capabilities, that partner is in your ecosystem, and so are those capabilities, right? So we're not constraining ourselves. The other thing is the capability map, information map, and value streams, right? Uh, you can't see the business unit alignment in there. You can reorganize your organization to your heart's content structurally, and the capability map and information map and value streams will largely remain unchanged, right? The organization map will change, that's fine. And we cross map over to that, right? But the holistic view is critically important because we look at things as a whole, not as a, not as a bunch of puzzle parts, right? Persistent. You build your business architecture and then you evolve it. You don't build it every time you do a strategy or a program or a project. It is built and it is established and it is used over and over and over. And as you use it, you can mature it, add a little more to it as you learn things, right? So it gets to be a richer and richer view of your organization. Outside in, um, it, not doing a deep dive on value streams today, but we do look at customer first. Uh, we also look at partners. And we, we do have this outside perspective as well as an inside perspective, right? So we look at both from an outside in and an inside out view. We also look at not just the value consumption or value creation rather of value for stakeholders, uh, particularly focus on customers, but also internal stakeholders and partners. But we also look at the value consumption and we look at those through the same lens, through the value stream lens. We look at Here's where we're creating value for the customer. Here's where the customer is consuming value along the way and at the end. Align and improve, related disciplines, right? It makes them better. Um, strategic planning, well, wouldn't it be nice if I had a, a holistic perspective? I wanna do a reorg to my organization. Wouldn't it be nice if I had an organization map to use that from? I don't know how people do it right now um, without one, right? Um, I want to look at the customer experience. I can, I can connect that to the business architecture. I want to improve how I deliver products to my customers. I, I want better products. I want more streamlined products. Business architecture can help. I want better requirements. My requirements are all over the map. They're not focused, right? I need to improve how I deliver data and application architecture. All of these things can benefit from business architecture. One thing I do realize or understand because, and I run into this a lot in my training is, you know, about day three when the lights go on in our boot camp we run, is individuals new to business architecture often say, it's a different way to think about the business. And it is absolutely a different way to think about the business, right? Um, it is a very different way. Why is that? Well, we're not looking at flow. We're not looking at process because you quickly devolve into a tangle web of, 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 um, of detail that, that you can't almost dig yourself out of. Rather, it represents the ecosystem as a, a set of discrete rationalized business objects uh, 
finite, discrete, and rationalized business objects and actions against those objects. And those are your capabilities. That's the way it looks at the organization. It looks at everything as an action against an object, right? Now that might sound a little techy, um, but it's essentially a breakdown of how organizations um, really work if you sort of eliminate the flow concept. We look at value. Value streams are, are uh, ultra critical in our thinking. And, and that's, that's very important, right? End-to-end -end stakeholder value delivery versus process, which is flow-based, right? Uh, value streams are nonlinear, processes are linear, right? So we fully, fully maximizing business architecture. And this is what a lot of people don't understand when they start out on the journey. At the end of the day, if you really want to maximize the value of business architecture, there needs to be a rethinking and a cultural shift in how you plan and how you deliver on your strategies uh, much more holistically. So here's a list of the scenarios. I touched upon a few of them, and this is just a short list here. Um, Model-driven transformation, um, improving the customer experience, uh, things like regulatory compliance. Uh, we have something in business architecture called policy management. It's particularly useful for that. Um, joint ventures, uh, um, uh, improving our product portfolio. Uh, the digital twin. Well, what's it a twin of? It's a twin of the business. Well, where's the, where's the mirror that I'm looking into? What's the business mirror for the digital twin? Oh, well, we have an object-based perspective on our organization with objects and actions, with value and stakeholders. That seems like a good place to start, right? Uh, shift to a customer-centric business model. This is a very, very short list, um, and, and the list can go on. And it's used both tactically as well as strategically. Uh, there's no industry that I haven't seen that, that um, um, I haven't seen any industry not using business architecture, right? But I, I did do a little bit of a listing here um, it, to some degree in terms of most common, right? In financial services, uh, that probably is what I've seen as the most widely uh, uh, the industry that uses business architecture the most, the most uh, uh, widely. Insurance, absolutely. Healthcare, the providers, not as much as needs to be. Government, it depends where you are. In the UK government, they're using the, the, the BizBoc perspective across at least 25 different you know, departments, ministries, um, et cetera. Um, you go to some other governments, you're not going to see it as much, right? Uh, manufacturing, it's, it's becoming more and more common on a global basis. Transportation as well. Uh, retail, not so much. Telecommunications, yes. Utilities, energy companies, just sort of getting into it. Professional service firms, the same, right? Technology firms are using business architecture as well. So, but it's, again, it's not restricted, right? Um, there's a team I mentor from the World Bank, World Bank that's part of this international development organization's uh, this United United Nations group, and um, you know they want to use business architecture for what they do, and 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 again, even startups. So, uh, who benefits, right? So these are, you know, you might say, well, I don't need to know anything about business architecture. I'm a I'm a strategic planner, right? Well, there's some things in here that might be useful for you, right? Or I don't need it. I'm I'm just involved in in you know portfolio management. Well. Right. It's it's we, we can we can sort of lay out our investment strategies with business architecture. Right. So this is the list. And it's 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 not a, again, it's not a complete list, but um, you can kind of look through here. And when you look at the presentation um, sort of afterwards with the PDF and so forth, take a look at what what some of this um, uh, what, what some of these these value propositions are for some of these different areas. Um, if, if I was a data architect and I had a really good business architecture and a business architects I could work with, I would want to get my hands on that as quickly as possible, right? A lot of data architectures I've seen are missing key data and they're missing key data because they haven't recognized certain business objects that are in the ecosystem that, that just historically have never been in data models, right? Uh, the concept of a decision, is that in, is that in there? Take a look at a lot of data models and try to find a, uh, an entity or a class called agreement. You might not find it, which means that they're using a bunch of other things to sort of mimic agreements, right? So you're, you're missing, you know, agreements or contracts, right? Well, our whole organizations are built on agreements and contracts. So you, you can look at this list. I, I was with one organization where we did, um, we used uh, business architecture for onboarding personnel. This is the HR view at the bottom, the last one on the list, uh, and evaluating role definitions. Uh, I see no reason why that shouldn't be as well. Uh, 
so this is an engagement model, and I've got a couple of views of this one on the next slide as well. But you say, well, well, where, what kind of value would they deliver? And and the, the thing I want to point out, oops, sorry, the thing I want to point out on this on this slide is you, you can see sort of all these things around the edge and strategic planning. I give you capability and value insights, and you know the customer experience that would connect over to my my customer journey maps to my value streams. Uh, the program managers uh, cross initiative impact analysis. So these are the things you can deliver. I want to highlight that the, the ones that are in blue are, are actually uh, usually, not always, but most of the time they're in the business uh, community. The ones that are in light orange here are, are, are generally in the IT community, right? Now, different organizations organize differently. What you'll see here is that the business architecture is being used by and engaged with more in the more uh, areas in the business community than you see in the technology community. So to have a business architecture in IT, it's really counterintuitive when I should be working with the business as much or more than I work with IT. So you'll see that, you know, some of those insights. Um, what does the practice look like? So let me just kind of run this through for you uh, so you can sort of visualize it if you're not in an organization that has business architecture. Uh, so you generally would have a small yet nimble center of excellence. Uh, that's a core group of uh, business architects, and it doesn't have to be large. I've seen organizations uh, that have maybe five people in the center. Uh, that are, you know, multi, multi, multi billion dollar, you know, large scale organizations, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't other people using business architecture. There are and there must be, right? But uh, somebody has to sort of maintain the, the business architecture within the knowledge base and so forth and, and evolve it. Now, if the demand goes up, you can always add people to the core group, right? But ideally, you're, you're extending that perspective, right? And, and we just don't have those five people understand business architecture. We want to get many people understanding business architecture. The core group can mentor what we call federated business architects that reside in different business units. They should all be practicing the same way under the same principles and the same best practices and the same guidelines and using the same foundational business architecture. They should all be connected, not structurally in terms of reporting, but in terms of principle and, and guidelines and, and um, an approach, right? So we have the federated business architects. We also have the IT architects, right? Um, and, and other perspectives across the business. So ideally business architecture resides in the business. It's relatively close to the executive suite. Um, one of the ways it works well is reporting up to uh, planning and transformation teams. So uh, that, that is one way where you can make it really work. So leveraging business architecture and practice. So here's just four sort of quick citations. This is from something called the uh, Tales from the Front, the Business Architecture Guild. Uh, if you go to businessarchitectureguild.org, uh, it has something called uh, Tales from the Front in there. You can, you can just do a search on it. Um, this link might be active in the PDF, but these are just four quotes and each of these um, quotes are pulled out of like these one page snippets. And I think there's a, there's a good dozen plus in there from different organizations and different industries. But PNC Bank, they said, uh, to truly reimagine banking, business architecture enables leaders to focus on the what before jumping into execution, uh, taking a progressive approach to organizing its architecture teams to proactively help leaders enhance capabilities, enable strategy definition and execute new opportunities. Uh, from a ABN AMRO out of the Netherlands, Business architecture is about connecting the dots to translate strategy to execution. Right? Uh, a power company, uh, their architect said, when it comes to asset management, knowing where to begin is one of the many challenges. To improve asset performance, business architecture is critical in guiding the business to determine the right focus. And then the last one was Wells Fargo uh, from Teresa Garcia. Business architecture helps to provide executives, and, and, and she's in a strategy team. Uh, executives and leaders transparency to ensure common capabilities are leveraged and enables a better understanding of how processes, policies, information, and so on are connected to ensure uh, thorough and efficient impact analysis, right? And direct investments effectively, right? So these are just four. Uh, there's a bunch more of those. Organizations are using business architecture. It's not a new thing. Um, sometimes it's shocking and surprising as to who's using it. Uh, it is being used globally. It's not isolated to one region of the world or another, right? 
Um, this is one quick sampling of what was done uh, by a business architect uh, in an entertainment company who was concerned about the um, uh, proliferation of its streaming products. Now, this is a few years old, but every time they put a new streaming product out, right, uh, and they were, they were rolling these out for different channels that they had, uh, they ended up um, building out uh, new technologies, right? There was an, an app layer that, that, you know, you have to download, right? And that's connected to backend systems. Uh, now, just showing the top and the bottom of this, you know, that's not showing the management anything they don't know, other than there seems like there's an awful lot of systems back down here, right? What, what they didn't realize and what the, the business architecture brought to the table is this cross-section of capabilities, which again is a, a cross-section, not at one level or another, but just sort of grabbed a bunch of them, uh, are basically the same capabilities that are being automated for every one of these products. Now, then they did an acquisition or a merger and they ended up doubling the number of streaming projects, products. So they needed to, what they do is to put a consolidation strategy together. This was the one slide messaging that was spent uh, by the business architect in a 10 to 15 minute meeting to sort of get that messaging across and sort of shift the thinking towards um, streamline, optimize, consolidate away from proliferate, expand and redundancy, right? So um, one of the big values of business architecture is you can create customized views for your senior people to sell ideas that might be hard to sell when this piece in the middle, and in this case, it was just capabilities, there's more to it, obviously didn't exist. Right? Um, let me give you a quick run through of the industry resources from the Business Architecture Guild, and then we'll talk about sort of building out, um, you know, your skill sets and, and where you want to take things, right? So first of all, um, many people sort of aren't quite clear on what the Guild is. It is a member-based, so you join it and you're a member and you can do all kinds of things in there, join teams, uh, you know, watch and deliver and watch webinars, uh, you know, work on papers, evolve content that gets delivered back out to members. There's lots of that going on. All the content in the guild gets built by members and then is redistributed back out to the members as quickly as possible, right? It's a not-for-profit, right? It's, it's a 501c6 for those who track those things, but it's not there to make any money. It's not owned by anybody. It has a board, uh, which, which uh, you know, is is a custodian essentially of the organization that takes care of it, right? Um, and, and it's of business architecture practitioners. So it's of people specifically interested in, in learning and building their skills in business architecture. And lots of people build their skills in working on teams, right? It's the source for business architecture, which includes, I mentioned earlier, the BizBot guide, right? Which is the body of knowledge, white papers, which are produced on a fairly regular basis by different teams, case studies, which uh, normally come out of the annual summit that's run, but um, uh, there's a sort of a continuous effort to try to build out more case studies, monthly webinars, which are very educational that are uh, member only, industry reference models. And right now there's, I think, eight available, um, if my, my math remembers right, uh, with a ninth one coming this year, uh, so if you're in financial services, you would download that model and use it in your organization. Uh, the only rule of thumb is you can't share it with anybody. Um, if they want it, they should join the guild. It's $125. It's cheap. Uh, it's 125 bucks. You can get the model for your organization and use it all you want. So there's no, you're not paying for anything. Everything in the guild uh, that's available is free uh, for your membership. But again, you don't take it and try to resell it or reuse it or redistribute it. Uh, that that's sort of a no-no. But uh, using it, you know, I, if if I worked for Wells Fargo and I'm a member, Teresa Garcia is one of those. She actually leads a team at the Guild. Um, you know, she she has access to the model. That model can be used across Wells Fargo. There's no restrictions on that. Just you know, you're not supposed to give it away. Um, it, it owns a certified business architect program. More and more people are getting certified. There's third-party training accreditation as a vendor program, and there's an academic program, right? Um, and you can sort of read all about that on the Guild website. Um, and the Guild member community spans uh, most industry sectors, uh, many thousands of members across over 100 countries. Uh, there are There is also a corporate membership um, for convenience and the place for global industry collaboration, right? 
Uh, there's just an excellent active community, by the way, where people ask questions and talk to each other and welcome each other. Th this is just a list of a lot of the content that's out there. But if you're really interested, go to businessarchitectureguild.org, right? Again, nobody profits from this. It's all not for profit, but this is a lot of where this information is available. Let's talk about moving forward with business architecture. As an individual, let's say um, relatively new to the discipline, uh, want to try to sort to figure out what's this thing all about? Sounds like an interesting thing. Maybe there's a gap that I'm missing somewhere. Um, well, one, one easy way is join the guild, right? It's 125 bucks a year. It's a no brainer. You get everything. Everything's free. Certification does. There's a fee for certification, but that that's largely the cover sort of third party fees. Um, there is a corporate membership where you can group things. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, if, if, if there is a growing interest in that, you can always contact the guild. Uh, leverage your offerings, get educated. Um, they have a, a, an excellent program where they've accredited a bunch of training companies around the globe, um, a number in Europe, New Zealand, of course, North America, and so on. Um, uh, you can engage in collaborative teams. It's an excellent way to build out your skills. Um, all the teams are very welcoming. They'll work you into the process. Uh, they'll give you mu as much work as you sort of feel comfortable with. Get your CBA certification. Now, if you're an organization, this is the tougher, tougher one to crack, right? So it's like, how do I convince somebody in my organization that we need to do this? Well, one is, you know, showing them this presentation. Um, communicate the value proposition. Start there as a strategy and execution enabler. That's key, right? Identify your five to top 10 areas of focus where business architecture can provide value. Say, you know that thing we goofed up that we spent three years on and we had to cancel and we spent $50 million? We could have done that better. Business architecture can help. Uh, at a very, by the way, minimal investment, right? Establish a practice and a charter. Make sure you have a clear value proposition and engagement model so people understand where you fit. The engagement model is so critical. I see so many organizations not have that. Deploy a minimally viable baseline. You can do that largely with the reference models, including what's called a common model. Um, but generally, you'll, you'll find a model is sort of, that either fits directly or, or can fit close to what you need. Get the appropriate individuals trained and certified and deploy a roadmap because there's a lot once there's more to it than than meets the eye and and building out there's a maturity model you can use to sort of self-evaluate the guild offers to people but um you want to build out uh essentially that uh your practice and mature the practice mature its use mature the business architecture and mature the different focal points that you work on. So over time, you'll want to sort of set, set some roadmap, roadmap markers and milestones that you can hit that you can say in one year, we're going to be here in two years, we'll be at this level in three years, everybody's going to be using business architecture to do this and that. Right. So with that, I know it's a quick run through. Uh, I want to get to my questions uh, to the questions and I will let uh, uh, John and, and company sort of facilitate the discussion here. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah, this, this is great. Thanks for the run through again. And a, a couple of people mentioned that, um, how is this different from last time? Bill changed a couple of slides up, but it, I think we said in the beginning, one of the things we wanted to make sure is we recorded this. A lot of people asked me for the recording and I didn't have it. So the, the main thing today was captured on recording and then and then we get a, a cleaner version of it. I have a couple of questions from uh, Mark. I think Mark had to leave. Uh, but he wanted to get, we've been focused a lot in service now lately, and then also with some of our, our customers on value streams. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you guys have been doing that a lot in the Guild, so it's nothing new yeah. over there, but it's kind of new to this audience. So what's, what's your perspectives on value streams? And then where do they come in the maturity of business architecture? Yeah, so they, they are part, value streams are part of the minimally viable baseline. So if you right. want to, um, so they're, they're the first, go to target for strategy execution, right? So you can look at a capability map and you know, the, the, an average capability map, depending on your industry might have um, anywhere from 35 to, to 45 level one capabilities that might be a little large. Some are smaller, some industries are smaller. Um, when, when you break those down and you start to get to level two, level three and so forth, now, now you're talking about, um, you know, capability maps that I've seen that, that range sort of between 1500 and, and, and well over 2000 capabilities, right? You don't want to just randomly say, I'm going to invest in this capability because I don't know where that fits in the context, right? What I want to say is I have a customer issue. I want to, I've set this objective. 
And uh, I've got this KPI I'm trying to target. And here's what I think I need to do to accomplish that, right? So the first thing you do is you've narrowed it down very, very quickly to just customer engaging, customer trigger, customer engaging value streams. And then you say, well, what's the context? Well, it's while they're using the product. All right. So now I've narrowed it down to probably, you know, for the most part, one value stream. Uh, that value stream will have a cross mapping, what we call, to the capabilities. So if I go to stage one and you've got a full cross mapping, I go to stage one, stage two, it shows you all the capabilities necessary for you to deliver value for, and, and to ex exit that stage, right? Get to stage two. At same thing, stage three. So now I can say the weakness is, is in stage three or stage four of this value stream. Here's where we're faltering, right? Now I look down the list and I've got a quick filter into the capabilities. Now what I want to do is target the capabilities that are, that are underperforming, heat map those, or if I haven't done it already, look at the effectiveness and then say, what do I want to get to? What do I, how do I need to change the behavior of those capabilities to get to where I want to go? From the capability, you can then go multiple directions. The information is the logical one. Do I have all the information the capability needs? There's a cross mapping to the information uh, concepts there. Um, I can go out to the technology, right? What, what systems are implementing it for this particular value stream for this particular cap, uh, cap, set of capabilities, right? I can go to the technology. I can go other ways too. I can follow it the process if I want. I can follow it to a number of other areas. So the value stream is the go-to uh, target for issue analysis, uh, strategy impact assessments, and that type of thing. We always start we try to always start. There's, there's certain scenarios that don't start with a value stream, but most of them start with going directly into the value stream. Now, so if I want to say, here's what I want to improve, the value stream becomes a target of that. So that, that's, that's the way to think about it. And your, 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 um, your, cable, your, um, your business architecture, your baseline, depending on your industry, and if you include a lot of your internal value streams, because internal value streams are important too, like execute operation, uh, deploy product, you know, that type of thing. Th those, when you include those, you're probably running around 25 to 30. If it's a more complex business model, 25 to 30 to 35 value streams. We're not talking about hundreds. We're mm -hmm. talking about a very short, very aggregated, very sort of consolidated list. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then um, the, let me go back here real quick. So we have a lot of people that don't have business architecture today. Um, so this is in, in service now, those parts that overlap um, on the capabilities and the value streams. What I did here is I loaded the value streams from the government reference model and the mm -hmm. value stream, and then also the, um, the business capabilities yep. um, in a model. Would, would your suggestion be to take that whole reference model and then map that into um, map that into a product and then start to take them away? Or do you kind of review the reference model in a spreadsheet and then generally populate your repository afterwards? You, you picked an interesting one. Um, okay. So the government one is pretty holistic. So um, it, I, I'll give you an answer for the government one. Um, mm -hmm. It covers a lot of territory, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so oh, yeah. one of the things to think about with government is I, I probably would take the approach of let's streamline away the, the non-essentials. Now, capability-wise, that may not, not be a long list. You may find that you, you want to keep most of them, right? And there's, yeah. no, there's no downside to that. Value stream-wise, uh, you're going to probably run into a situation where it's like, well, you know, our agency or our department would never do this, right? I don't really need that, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, there's no harm in, in carrying those into your model, right? Um, it is a large model. I think it's the largest model. It's got a lot of capabilities. It's got, and in fact, yeah, 25, think, 12, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I think, um, yeah, and I, I, I just, one thing I saw, I'm not even sure if it's, if maybe it is the latest, um, but, but they're still working through a lot of scenarios over there, and they're still looking at, at potentially new value streams and things like that. But it is a, it is a monster. If, if I'm looking more at financial services, I would say, you know, just load the whole thing in. If I'm looking at, um, you know, some of the other sectors out there, I would say load the whole thing in. If I'm a state government and I look at the government reference model, there's probably, because it, 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 it's meant to cover both state, local, and federal um, or national uh, sort of uh, coverage, right? You may look at it and say, well, this is something the federal government does, and I don't really need to worry about that, right? And, mm -hmm. and so I don't necessarily need to have that in there. Now, you know, the, 
I look at one of the value streams there to deploy government service. If you're in government, you absolutely need that value stream. That's to put out new services that you're going to deliver to your constituents, right? Yeah. But um, it's it's an interesting model. It's a great model. Um, it's it's got a great team. Um, if you are in the guild and you are in government, uh, you know they're always looking for new folks there. They roll people in pretty pretty easily. Uh, there's an amazing cross section of organizations in there from all over the world. Um, I forgot how many. A, a lot of the teams cover like multiple continents and that, but um, th there's some, there's some, one of the leads is uh, out of the UK government and uh, the other ones from the U S but, um, um, but the government's a little bit But like I said, if I'm insurance, uh, telecommunications, some of these other ones, I would just, you know, roll in the whole model. The government one's probably the only one I might do a little bit of calling to. Awesome. Yeah. We have a, we have a couple of people on here that are actually authors from the IT for IT. Okay. And um, a big switch in IT for IT version three was to move to uh, more digital products. Okay. And we've been talking about that a lot on the call. And we're seeing a lot of people switching from, they say the switch from project management to product management, right? And there's a lot of, a lot of buzz going on around that right now. Have you found a different intersection with people moving to digital products from, from like traditional project management? And You with, know, so with, the Guild does not use the term product for in internal content okay. right um internal content exchange or internal exchanges wh whether they be called uh, service exchanges etc are structurally uh dependent right so if if i take my business unit structure and take it like a jigsaw puzzle and dump it upside down and scramble it all around i yeah. break that model right? Business architecture's rule of thumb is you can't break the business architecture by reorganizing, right? Reorganizing, right? So business architecture only looks at product in relation to the end customer. In government, that's the constituent. In healthcare, that's the patient, right? So we're not looking at an external exchange, right? Um, the, the reason we don't do that is because it reinforces the siloing that business architecture seeks to decouple, right? So that's the reason. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. It just means that business architecture doesn't look at it that way. Now, if you're delivering digital products to your customer, they're treated the same. In fact, business architecture becomes even more important, right? Um, because there's capabilities that enable uh, products that are delivered to customers. There's a direct mapping there, and it's actually a fairly sophisticated mapping. So the, the service element of what's delivered to, to, co to, to companies or organizations as, as, as your products or services, right? Um, those are directly enabled by, um, uh, by capabilities, and that's incorporated into the Guild meta model. And where there's weaknesses and capabilities, you can trace that back to uh, the automation of those capabilities. So you build out that knowledge base connection between the automations and the capabilities and the, the services they deliver to the customers. So we, the focus is on the end customer, right? That doesn't mean, again, you can't sort of tweak it or whatever and, and, and you know, use it for your internal perspectives. It's just that the, um, the de-siloing nature of business architecture's uh, minimal core um, does, doesn't really lend itself to looking at sort of um, silo exchanges. Awesome, awesome. Good deal. Yeah, I see there's a there's a, um, a link to the Business Architecture Guild. That's actually how I found it is from the TOGAF documentation, but there's not one in IT for IT. Um, so we were just talking about that back and forth a little bit. Yeah, and somebody, I did see one question pop by that I, I caught a glimpse of. It says, no, reference models are for guild members only. At $125, I don't think it's a large ask, okay? So, yeah. um, and they are to be used internally. Um, I want to stress that um, the guild does, uh, does web scans and a lot of other stuff. Um, and, and we'll find if there are... Um, uh, exchanges, right? So if you're a consulting company and you've got a model that you want your client to use, um, tell them to, you know, spend the 125 bucks to download it. And then you can work with them to your heart's content, right? Okay. We're, we're, we're not asking for a lot of money here, right? It's, it's a no brainer. So if you're trying to avoid spending $125, please don't do that. But you will see when you get the models, you are not supposed to share those outside your organization. Again, $125, it's not a high bar to make, right? I had a question on that too. Some, and just to be clear, some people think that 
only you can use it. You personally, when you get the membership, but you can use it company for your company only. That's what it really means. Right? It's for your company. Yes. yes. I mean, I, I used Wells Fargo. What One Wells Fargo member can download the model and then deploy it across Wells Fargo. What they can't do is give it to PNC Bank. Okay. okay. And let me, just show you, from, right? let me show you real quick. I know there's a, so if you go to the businessarchitectureguild.org and you go under resources and under resources, you'll see uh, industry reference models. And then it's a couple of clicks to get there. But if you go to the online store yep. and then in the online store, you'll come down here, you'll see the industry reference models. And that'll give the list of the, uh, I think, Bill, you said seven uh, that are available. But yeah. just because your industry isn't there doesn't mean there's nothing for you. Uh, right. Yeah. If, if, if I was in, in uh, for example, uh, utilities, I'd probably pick up the telecom model and make adjustments to it. Oh, that's um, good because somebody just, was asking me about that one the other day. Just as an example, right? Yeah, um, Amanda, one of our see, EAs. Some are much more mature than others. Um, the common model, by the way, if you want it, you can start with it. But all the other ones, you'll you'll see. By the way, that you you can get the models if you're not a member, but it's three hundred and fifty dollars per model, and you don't get any updates, right? Yeah. If you join as a member at one hundred and twenty-five dollars. You can get all the models you want and get all the updates, right? So, you know, financially, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to spend $350, right? Yeah. Um, uh, the common model is a subset of the other models. And uh, and their common content was customized for some models, but there is a common core. The common core essentially is to evolve things like HR and work management and stuff that everybody does, Right. And then that gets filtered back into the other models, right? Yeah. And, um, you know- I just logged in and you see the prices all drop to zero because I logged yep. in. And they're all free, right? Yep. Um, yeah. And uh, the International Development Organization, so there's more than seven, I guess, so I was probably a little off on that. There's a companion guide. That's a generic companion guide that's sort of set up for the common model. Each of the industry sectors will have a companion guide. And uh, what that is, is what's special about that industry's model and it also has the base model, but also here are scenarios on how you would use the model to, for example, uh, improve how you're delivering um, uh, credit card services or to improve how you would be executing a trade within a financial institution. So um, every industry sector will eventually, it's, it's slow go, but eventually have a, um, uh, some sort of companion guide with that. Okay. And two things really quick. Um, one, the value streams that I showed today are in tables. You have to go to the ServiceNow store and download the value stream tables. So just go to the store and type in value stream and you'll you'll be able to get that. And there's no charge for that. It's part of the base models. It's just, you have to download it. And then the other question, uh, the other thing is just a, a comment on something Bill said earlier. When I joined the BA Guild, one of the best things I got from it wasn't all of the data and the papers, but to be able to participate on those weekly meetings for government. So I never get to practice business architecture because I just go in and try to help business architects and our customers. But the one time during the week that I do get to practice business architecture is when I'm on that call with the other business architects. Uh, so if you are trying to get into this discipline and it's something you haven't done before, uh, just you know, getting in there and tapping into their minds is, uh, is, is a good way to get started. It really helped me a lot. Bill, uh, we're over time, so thank you so much again for uh, for rerunning this for us. Really appreciate that. Okay, thanks, John. Right. Bye, everybody. Okay.